Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Townsend, editor of Place Northwest. Welcome to this event on transport and infrastructure. It's a very good time to stage this event, in fact, this week, as we just heard that the government is to start re renationalising the rail network with the creation of Great British Railways, which will set timetables and prices and manage rail infrastructure. And then not too many weeks ago, Greater Manchester approved plans to defranchise its bus network to help it create a London style public transport system, while preparation to deliver the HS2 Northern Spur is also gaining momentum. Elsewhere in the region, local authorities are setting out ambitious plans to use transport as a regeneration tool, connecting people, places and businesses to grow local economies and encourage more sustainable ways of getting about. So we're going to be discussing all of this and more today as the lockdown continues to ease and we can all finally start moving about a bit more freely. I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Waterman and BECG. We've got 80 people registered, so we're certain to have some great opportunities for people to mingle with others working in the sector. A quick bit of housekeeping. From June the 24th, Place Northwest will be staging in-person events again for the first time in more than a year, which is pretty exciting. Check out our website for full details and to register. Today, though, we're using Remo, which we found to be a brilliant alternative over the last few months. For those of you less familiar with Remo, the networking opportunity is the big difference when compared with other platforms such as Zoom. So please create your own profile so that when someone clicks on you, they can read who you are and what you do. And don't be shy, turn on your cameras and let people see you. To move around the room and talk to people, just double click on a table and you'll be taken straight there where you can then video chat with other guests. There's also private messaging through the chat button. And of course, we've got the Q&A button as well, where you can direct questions to our panellists that we'll then weave into our discussions. Um, and I'll, I'll say here that the questions will stay up between the first and the second panels. So if your question hasn't been answered in the first panel, we will hopefully try to get to it in the second one. Um, so do keep them coming. Today's event is split into um, two panel sessions, both of which have a presentation before them. And then we've got a networking break in between. There's also half an hour of networking at the end, so you can carry on making contacts and doing business. So I think without further ado, let's kick off today's event. First up, we've got a presentation by Tom Stannard, Chief Executive of Salford City Council. Together with its delivery partners, Salford is working on the present master plan and other schemes that will seek to improve connectivity across a borough that's really packed with development activity at the moment. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here this morning and a uh, you know, real pleasure to um, come back to Great Manchester and, and really have a bit of a conversation with um, Place Northwest, who I know and love over the years, um, about this uh, very important issue for us um, in GM. So I've been asked to talk about the role of transport infrastructure, as you can see from my first uh, page there, um, in supporting <clears throat> an inclusive economy. Um, and I think this is really um, a, a crucial issue for us in the city. It's a crucial issue for, for me personally, for those of you um, who I've known over the years and um, uh, uh, having worked in GM before and other parts of the Northwest, really, um, is that key role in using all different um, transport infrastructure um, and property regeneration investments in, su in supporting inclusive growth. So I really welcome the focus of the event on that um, today. And I want to talk particularly about um, Salford's role in driving that growth and connectivity of GM and the city centre you know, people will know us as having had big achievements with significant growth nodes over the city over the last 15 to 20 years. But there's a much bigger ambition to come with that, um, uh, building on the success of everything you can hopefully see in my uh, background behind me. Don't worry, I'm not in a different time zone at night in the middle of uh, Media City. But, um, you know, there is a, a big growth ambition still to come in the redevelopment of and connectivity crucial to driving that growth. But I think... Sarah, the point that I really want to <clears throat> emphasise throughout the talk today and hopefully in the Q&A as well um, is the increasing, massively increasing importance we all know of mobility for well-being and for sustainability as well as for that economic gain per se. And I want Salford to be central to those debates 
not just in a policy sense, but central to the delivery of that ambition for well-being and sustainability um, as well. So if we could move on to my next slide, please, Laura. And this really covers um, context for Salford City Council in Greater Manchester as a key um, driver of that growth of the whole conurbation, the city region. Um, colleagues on the call will know we've been a, a core partner in that growth ambition for, for many years now. And we've quite recently been a core partner with Manchester City Council in delivering that new city centre transport strategy as part of um, GM's 2040 um, long-term ambition. And that's been a really important piece of work, um, partly because, you know, it, it helps to set the context for our infrastructure ambition, but also because it aims to create that city region where people have got a better quality of life um, with improved health, greener environment and the stronger economy and all of that our net zero um, ambition. And Salford's got a key role to play in delivering that ambitious growth plan for the whole of the GM city region. Um, we've got lots of the land, lots of the growth nodes and growth zones that are going to accommodate that forecast growth um, still to come, as we've successfully demonstrated in the trajectory you can see there on the slide. But as I said at the outset, the goal that wraps around all of that is not just economic gain um, per se, but it's accessible mobility um, for well-being and accessible mobility to help us with those sustainability goals that I think is going to be really important to us over the over the medium term. So on on my next slide, if you if you could, Laura, please, um, the city of challenge and opportunity um, in equal measure. You know, this is really about why we have those twin challenges I've mentioned of well-being and sustainability and. And you know, we've, we've put that in many different ways over the years. Um, we're still the 18th most deprived local authority area in the country alongside the kind of huge anti-poverty and inclusivity challenges um, that have all been, as we all know, um, exacerbated, worsened arguably by the COVID experience. One of my prominent councillors here in Salford calls it often a tale of two cities. And there is that sense of um, not physical division, but that sense certainly of economic division between everything we've achieved in the core growth areas and the keys particularly, and the heart that you know the remainder of um, the quite large city area of Salford and our other towns. So our focus now has got to be really in that context on how we intervene and leverage that economic benefit for the growth that's still to come and in in COVID um, for all communities and all towns of the city. Um, and the transport challenges that sit behind that, I think, are well known, faced by many regions in the country, affordability, reliability. Sarah's already mentioned the decisions we've made quite recently in GM on bus franchising that have to be part and parcel of that debate. And there is a huge amount of infrastructure investment and activity underway to try and help us to address some of those challenges already. And we've got big areas of that in Salford, 60 million or so of improvements for cycling and walking as part of the GM Mayor's Challenge Fund and a, a good 110 million plus chunk of the growth deal for our major infrastructure um, schemes. But I think in the inclusivity challenge, one of the biggest challenges we've got in Salford is that issue about the labour market and our historic skills deficit across the board. And why is that relevant to us today? I think it's because um, really that means the need for true accessibility of new jobs. And that's new jobs in the new economy and the stuff you can see on the slide behind me, but it's new jobs in the foundational economy as well across GM. And that means the accessibility of those jobs to residents in areas like Little Halton, in, in, in Earlham, Walkden, um, not just those people who live in and around the city centre and the Keys itself. So I think that's going to be a really important part of the future strategy for us um, as a city region, really. So on the next slide, um, Please, Laura, thank you. Um, this is really about looking at the future potential of the innovation triangle as one of those major growth opportunities and arguably, I think, one of the major connectivity opportunities for the city um, in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, people will be familiar with some of the um, key components of that, but we're increasingly looking at the branding and positioning of the innovation triangle in Salford as a, you know, one of the key schemes within the innovation GM approach um, encompassing the Salford Royal, Media City and the Keys, um, and obviously um, the Crescent, which I'll come back to later. There's a strong master planning and delivery strategy sitting behind all of this for the expansion of those um, three areas. 
And those plans also include critically, I think, the potential to boost growth significantly for GM with the proposed Metrolink extension, linking the city centre itself in Manchester to the Crescent and from um, down to the Keys. And we see that as being a major transformational um, medium term opportunity that we're working hard on with GMCA, TFGM and other partners in the region. And we'll continue to look at um, sustainable modes of travel as part and parcel of that. And as I say, to link the whole innovation triangle approach to the emerging innovation GM um, strategy and framework, which I would, if colleagues aren't familiar with that, would definitely encourage people to look um, look more at that. On the next slide then, Laura, please, we also have a good track record and you can just see some uh, visuals of um, examples of this, of delivering transformational infrastructure that really kind of tries to experiment with um, diluting the mix of modes and the investment that supports that um, sitting around those core economic growth areas. And I, I see a lot of this as being really paving the way, pardon the pun, for us um, building on the inclusivity um, uh, mobility challenges I talked about. You can see on this page the um, uh, Trafford Road scheme, 20 million transformational scheme to support the continued growth of the keys, but with particular focus junction improvements on enhancing walking and, walking and cycling facilities. Um, and forerunners um, of the transport and infrastructure potential within innovation triangle um, and again you can see that with the university um, approach down at the crescent really as a test bed for transport innovation autonomous and automotive vehicle technology e-scooter trials for the first couple of phases there, linking down to the keys and media city and aligning the Salford royal into that approach as part of the third phase of that pilot scheme and you know we're in Salford for our love of cycling. I'm, I'm also, um, for my sins, known for that personally. And our investment in cycling infrastructure is a very important part and parcel of that. And um, I'm pleased to say that Chris Boardman not only praised me for doing a uh, laughingly called Tom's Tour de Salford um, in my first week or two of starting to get to know the city well on two wheels. Um, only got one puncture on the way, I'm pleased to report, so I didn't have to lambast the highways department too much. But more seriously, um, Chris has referred recently to Salford as really leading the way and providing real choices for people to leave the car at home, building partly on some of those schemes you can see on the slide there. And we want we want more rather than less of that very much linked to those sustainability objectives. Um, the next slide then just covers um, in a brief, Laura, thanks, um, the Crescent set to be one of GM's signature schemes in the medium term, very much part of the um, innovation triangle approach, as I've already mentioned. Um, major connectivity projects within this, um, which I can come back to in more depth later if it's helpful, but particularly people will have seen the Salford Rise scheme, which is part of our levelling up fund um, bid. <clears throat> and the master plan and delivery strategy at large for the Crescent has got a, a, a very strong vision, I think, around a new sustainable transport hub that will provide that mainline um, train station, heavy rail interchange, Metrolink as well, cycle hub, and a whole different range of um, end of trip facilities. And I think that is really about us making that a, an absolutely pivotal, sustainable gateway um, into Salford city centre and Manchester city centre and really trying to, um, if this is a thing, deconcretize um, the whole kind of environment in and around the Crescent and the visibility of the river and much, much more besides as part and parcel of that. I'm sure people have seen bits and pieces of that, but a quick plug for, you know, if you want more on that, take a quick look at um, our master plan and development framework. There's a there's a microsite, sulfurcrescent.com, uh, to have a, have a look at on that if you want to. And then my penultimate slide, Laura, please, is um, about the um, GM Western Gateway. And I just wanted to make quick mention of this, really, because... This is also one of the largest development areas in GM. Salford is a key partner to that, obviously, with our side um, of the uh, waterway. Got a very strong partnership now with Trafford um, on the branding and exploitation of the Western Gateway opportunity and supported really by the announcement in the budget recently of the um, Liverpool Freeport, of which Port Salford is going to be a key 
um, part. And this, this, as people will, I'm sure, be aware, is of huge strategic significance to GM's um, particularly carbon reduction target ambition, as well as our growth ambition in the long run, and gives us a real tangible opportunity, I think, to be a um, a very strong uh, UK leader here in Salford and EU leader in 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 that sustainable waterborne logistics um, of the future. So, I think the expansion of the Port Salford opportunity is going to be a really exciting one um, for um, the future of logistics and advanced manufacturing. Um, attractiveness of GM really, um, and obviously the area also includes the uh, the RHS, which we um, successfully opened this week. Um, hopefully, you didn't miss that one, but do look it up if you didn't. Wonderful area to to visit, um, but also lots of potential for the walking and cycling um, infrastructure around that area as well. So I think the Western Gateway also a really important one, Sarah, for the um, for the long run and for hopefully the discussion afterwards. Um, finally, then on my final slide, Laura, if 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 you could, um, just a few quick words on our towns and uh, connected neighbourhoods, and this is really the the clue on because of what I said at the start about accessible and sustainable um, mobility as well. Um, people will know um, the towns and neighbourhoods challenge well, I'm sure, but that diversity of district centres that have really strong potential to grow and thrive is vital really to how we support those local townships to um, redevelop, reimagine themselves, um, reinvent their high streets, um, and particularly to improve the public realm, leisure, recreational, the, the whole kind of livability offer really to which transport and connectivity is, is, is key. And in our case, we've got many examples of that as many of my colleagues elsewhere in Greater Manchester have walked and, Eccles with its Metrolink um, potential uh, all over it, but also Earlham, even Pendleton, Little Holton, towns that were already facing significant um, challenges from retail collapse before COVID, um, but also facing that twin challenge of economic and health and well-being challenges that have all been exacerbated by the pandemic. And I think all of that means through you know, the initiatives we're already putting in place, active neighbourhoods, the B Network programme, um, the access for all funding, lift access to our stations, park and ride facilities at Walkden and all the like of that, um, and our bus transit corridors ahead of the franchising um, uh, 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 programme moving forward are really helping us to try to promote and develop that strategy um, multimodal but accessible sustainable mobility for well-being and for community connectivity as well as for that economic gain per se and I think that's really um, essential to our future strategy and, and very much essential to my ambition as um, chief exec supporting the uh, the political leadership here in Salford so so I'll conclude there really Sarah on on this slide by saying you know I think as I've said for there is a huge growth um, potential for Salford, continuing to contribute to that growth of Greater Manchester, um, perhaps I think best demonstrated by the Innovation Triangle and its component parts at the um, hospital, the university and the Keys. But the inclusive growth agenda, um, absolutely essential, um, accessible um, transport, um, mobility for well-being, using the cycling and walking infrastructure to help us to, uh, you know, really address and attack those um, uh, deep-seated health and well-being challenges as well. Gives us a really strong, I think, pole position um, uh, in Salford on this whole agenda. Um, and I hope that's helpful as an introduction and look forward to a bit of Q&A and discussion. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Tom. Some, some really good examples there of how councils can link up property and transport to boost economies. And as you mentioned at the beginning, to also foster, foster well-being. Um, so a great introduction to our first panel session. We're going to be discussing emerging post-pandemic travel trends and also just generally how to deliver successful integrated transport and property projects. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Andy Heath, Managing Director of Mersey Rail, Tim Foster, Interim Strategy and Programme Director of Transport for the North, Councillor Hans Mundry, Cabinet Member for Transportation, Highways and Public Realm at Warrington Council, and Tom Stannard, Chief Exec of Salford City Council. So uh, welcome to you all. If you could activate your um, cameras and mics, please, if you haven't done so already. 
And to our audience, um, please do remember to submit questions through the Q&A button and we'll, we'll get to those as we, as we move through the discussion. So um, welcome to you all. Thank you. Morning. Hi. Morning. Morning. Hi. Um, okay, so um, I'll start with you, Tim. Um, by way of introduction, what's occupying um, Transport for the North's time at the moment? What are the sort of key policies and projects you're pushing for at the moment? <laughs> not yeah, too long on the list, but... <laughs> yeah, <quite a> I'll <laughs> try, not, I'll I'll try not to spend the next hour talking about, <laughs> talking about everything. Firstly and mostly immediately, the, the um, publication of the William Shapps Review yesterday, and I, I suspect we're going to pick that up um, through the session, so I'll 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 sort of not dwell on that. But that 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 actually the publication yesterday, the 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 bringing together a track and train, the the the, the opportunity to have a real to actually finally have a plan for the railways uh, and to have a a, a clear arm's length accountability um, is is really pertinent and it's really pertinent any other thing that's exercising our minds at the moment, which is about the Manchester the Manchester area for rail. Uh, and and in particular the consultation on um, services running through Manchester, uh, uh, and again the, the 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 disconnect that we're finding between decisions on uh, um, on infrastructure and on services. So really, that that whole that whole kind of bigger question about what what is rail now for post pandemic what is rail now for um how can we plan confidently for growth how do we make sure that we um uh have a really clear strategy and there is a there is a um a, a program of infrastructure investment in in rail that is that, that we know is badly needed to deal with the problems of today but can also accommodate that that the um the aspirations and expectations of places right across the north, um, not just in terms of um, uh, uh, of growing rail and as I said, dealing with the problems today, but is actually addressing all the issues um, that that Tom no, talked about in his session in a very integrated way. So, so rail, rail as ever, is taking a lot of our time, but sitting alongside that, uh, um, uh, at the real now sort of. Um, push towards decarbonisation and we just through through the TFM board uh, and the hands may say quite a bit about that um, uh, have agreed a, a, a the first decarbonisation strategy including including a trajectory uh, to 2045 um, that there's ever been done at that at that pan regional northern level so that's that's now I said that's a great piece of work that's been done is now out uh, is on the verge of going out for consultation um, and I think that's increasingly what you will see from TFN is that they, as well as making the case for transport investment, um, really showing how uh, transport needs to work alongside other things to deliver broader goals. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay, thanks for that, Tim. Loads there that we can pick up on as we as we go through our, our chat. Um, Councillor Mundry, can you tell us what you've got going on in in Warrington at the moment with regard to transport projects? We reported not long ago that the council was hatching plans for Bank Key Station to become a, a potential hub on the Northern Powerhouse rail line. I wonder if you could tell us where that's at, as well as other things that you're working on at the moment. Well, it's like a lot, like a lot of things. It's, it's sat with the government at present to make a decision on it. So what we're waiting for is then because I think what one thing we do know because we talk about touch points which will be stations basically there's so many touch, touch points in the uh, government plan a town centre touch point is, is actually one single town centre which we're we assuming is going to be Banky Station is is what's plan is in the government plan we know it's definitely in there but they've not announced they've not announced how it's going to be so we, what we're looking for is there going to be new infrastructure alongside that to make connectivity a lot quicker particularly between Manchester and Liverpool coming through Warrington and making us a key stopping point along that, open up the opportunities for people of Warrington to, to get to jobs opportunities uh, locally and further afield as well. We're trying to stop the, uh, keep the economy going in Warrington, but also to make sure the talent and skills of Warrington people can stay in Warrington and don't need to move to actually progress their careers and their opportunities. So that's, that's why rail transport is so important particularly for smaller towns and, and, and rather, rather just the big cities, to make sure we can keep the economy going and keep the skills that we need within the towns and bring income in uh, rather than having to people having to move to, to chase jobs, to chase 
uh, job opportunities and to chase career pro prospects. So rail connectivity is so vital to, to everybody to make sure is it speedy enough and I'm saying I can get a job anywhere in the country, I can get there quickly enough, safely enough and dependent enough so trains will be on time and regular enough. So it is important to us, particularly in Warrington, because what we one of a lot of things we're not working on lots of projects. And what you say with Warrington, we've got the Manchester Ship Canal coming through Warrington. So uh, freight transport on, on, on the waterways is important to us. And I think as Tom was saying, Port Salford does have an impact on Warrington. Because to get to Port Salford, you've got to come through Warrington. And uh, and that's that's why you'll have to look at the uh, the bridge because we've had lots of conversation about that but in the past. But the actual bridge crossings is important to us. So that's why we built a built a new bridge across the River Mersey. And so tra transport don't have to go through the town centre as much now. They can bypass the town centre and get from one side to the other. The bridge, which is only opened a couple of months ago. So that, that's one of our projects we're working on. And importantly, is, is some of the work we're doing with Peel Ports as well. To have, a memory, to have a memory of understanding about the bridge swings. So when, when any ships are coming to Port Salford, they're coming through Warrington, but then they're, they're actually disrupting the traffic in the town centre of Warrington, causing congestion. So we have got a good deal there now with Port, Port Salford, working quite well at present. So they will, they will uh, use the town centre at different times to the comfort at night time, not, not at peak time movements. So that's been a massive improvement for the Warrington people. And also the rail traffic and the road traffic because everything seems to come through Warrington. And that's what we're trying to look at projects to have the new bypass through the Western Link. It's about, I think, 250 million pounds, which will then you don't have to come through Warrington to get from one side to the other. You can actually you can use motorways and use the news link to, to get across the town. So that's that's a whistle top source. Some of the projects I've got lots more projects. I've got a new train station in Warrington, which we sort of pleased, pleased with that one as well. But um, I've got lots prepared, but I don't want to take up too much of your time go, go, going through it. I think it's a, the, uh, we've also talked about the cycleways and the, the, the first and last mile into the town. So if, you're, if, if your journey is only a mile, do you really have to use your car to go into town? Could, could, you, could you actually use the new cycle paths, the new walking ways and public transport, which is uh, we need to start building up again. So lots of other ways of getting in and out of town if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're living just outside of the town centre. And that's what we're looking at to, to reduce the congestion in town centres. Well, it's a combination of different things. So it's the walking and cycling, it's the uh, new link roads, it's the train movements and it's, pub and it's public transport. All these things can take congestions out of town centres without removing the opportunity of, of uh, personal choice and personal growth. Brilliant, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, it's a real sort of a multi-modal um, strategy that you've got going on there, isn't it? Um, and uh, and absolutely looking at you know what what journeys are best served by what what modes. Um, okay, Andy, you will have um, you will have seen firsthand the effects of the pandemic on on local transport networks. Um, Mersey Rail, you know, like so many operators, up in shorts or a slump in its passenger numbers over the past year. So I wonder, how are you guys managing the impact now, sort of as we start to emerge out of the pandemic, and how are you starting to galvanise people to get back on public transport again? Yeah, as touched on before, I, mean, I don't think any of us can underestimate the impact uh, of COVID on our lives, and not just not just over the last twelve months, but going forward. I mean, across the rail industry. Um, Back, go back to March last year, there was an, an 80 percent reduction in patronage, very much linked into into lockdowns. And that's placed significant um, financial pressures on train operating companies to the extent that the that, that contracts in their in their old form. I'll touch on a little bit on the the William Shaps review in a moment. Contracts in, in their old form, in the existing form in, in March last year became unsustainable. Which meant that the government had to had to step in to, to the extent that significant monies has been invested to actually keep the railways running alongside the fact that revenue has been so has been so low. The challenge for us now as we move forward is to look at, as you say, how we can attract people back onto the onto the rail networks, which transport in general. I think we all recognise in all our organisations that, that the way that people work will change. I think we have to accept that working from home will become, if not the norm, certainly half of the norm as people change. And we've got to make sure in the rail industry that, that we that we adapt. I think it's fair to say that the, the, the William Shapps review, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but but for me, because a lot of the, a lot of it will be the devil is in the detail. 
but it's really important for me in terms of the fact that I do believe I've been on the railway for 30 years now. I think it's too fragmented. I don't think organisations are aligned as well as they, as they could be. And that's exemplified just in, in one example. Over the last five years of the train operations that have come up for, for bid, two thirds of them have just been given to the current incumbent. No one has bid. So something, there's something fundamentally wrong there. And we welcome the, the, the uh, William Shapps review of the white paper because it allows us all just to, to, to step back. And the most important thing, the two important cores for me within the review, the first is the fact that we will have clear leadership and a simple structure with one control in mind. And that's really important because there's lots of stakeholders within the, within the transport industry. And they, they don't always they don't always pull together, sorry, in the in the rail industry. But absolutely crucial within that is making sure that money is spent where it's needed. And I don't want to pontificate too much about the North, but you know, there's 40 billion pounds to be invested in the rail industry, in the railway over the next the next five years. Historically, it's been it's been uh, in the south. And we need to make sure the fact that investment is is provided uh, is, is applied even handedly. And that leads me to the second part of the of the, the, the Williams Shapps review is the fact as part of that, there's a commitment that there will be uh, local teams working closely with regional regional authorities. And that's absolutely crucial to ensure that uh, all, everybody's rowing in the same way. Investment is 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 made where it's, where that is needed. And that links in very much the fact of making sure that we all work together so we have the combination of public and private sector to be able to do things to do things better and cheaper. And I don't want to, to, to regale now because I'll be here for the next two hours in terms of inefficiencies in the rail industries and the cost of getting things done and the, the bureaucracy. It exists. This gives the opportunity over the next two years as we move towards the implementation of the restructure of the railways to make sure that we have we get it right. And that has to take into account the integration, not just with local authorities, but, but other modes of transport. Ensure the money is spent where it is. Bring in more innovation from the private sector. That is needed as well. And make sure that we, we get it right. It's really exciting times for transport in general. As, as a probably to go around down well with, with, with most people on this call, there's a born and bred uh, Liverpudlian. I'm really passionate about it, but I'm passionate about transport in the north. I really, I really am. Or we can look back and play the woe is us card in terms of investments, or we can look positively um, forward and make sure that we can give the the, the north of England the, the railway and the transport links it deserves. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Um, I'd like to ask um, Tim a bit more about um, the, 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 the Shaps review in a, in, in a minute. But um, first of all, Tom, um, I've got a couple of questions for you, actually. Firstly, if, if you'd like to... Um, comment at all on on the rail review this week what your initial sort of response to it was you know is this going to be positive for the sector or or, or not <laughs> um and secondly what do you think are this going to be the sort of key post-pandemic travel trends that the sector will have to respond to over the coming months you know where will be the most opportunities yeah well i mean to be honest sir i think andy's covered um my two kind of most important reflections on william shapps in 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 his observations really one, one is about the i think the paramount importance of locality and involvement and engagement in what comes next whether that's a <clears throat> franchising pseudo franchise of contracts arrangement and dialogue you know the the key point is the um adequate reflection of um, locality and regional voice in actually determining future need and future patterns of infrastructure expenditure that follow that. But I think the fundamental point for me, Sarah, I mean, Andy put it well, but I also heard the comments that Jim McMahon, um, as the Shadow Transport Secretary, made in the House on all of this um, last night. And, you know, I'm to politicize this at all really but uh, Jim made quite an astute observation that what we've got to make sure is that we aren't just doing this reorganization as a shifting of the deck chairs with actually the you know to be yeah. end of the treasury sitting behind it and failing to make sure that investment follows the reorganization of the contracting commissioning and oversight um, responsibilities and I think Jim put that challenge very well when he said <clears throat> what we've seen up to this point is the nationalization of risk management as opposed to a very clear strategy for um, 
reinvestment and particularly you know i think to be fair we're speaking amongst friends and we're all a bit biased but particularly um in and around the north of england um on all of this and dialogues quite frankly in my last role when i was um regeneration director in wakefield about the need for um you know not just metrolink expansion in and around the lead city region but the heavy rail investment to properly deliver um, on NPR and the Leeds, Bradford, Manchester connectivity and all of those things, <clears throat> yes, they remain strategic priorities, but they remain expensive strategic priorities. And I think on this call, we are all realists in that space, Sarah. You know, we understand that if you increase and amplify locality and regional voice, you can for investment. But my God, if ever there was a time that um, the north of England needed it, it's now coming out of COVID, quite honestly, for all the reasons... I think Andy, Tim, Hans have put very um, eloquently in that I talked about in my presentation at the outset. So I think, you know, I, I think um, investment must follow the reforming of those relationships. I think the review is pointing in a positive direction in that respect, in terms of enhancing that locality voice, in terms of a better coordination of um, contracting arrangements and better coordination of ultimately investment strategy but investment strategy is one thing and actual capital to follow that i think is a um is a very different thing um i think in relation to your other point sarah about the trees after covid um i mean you know lots of us know and understand that transport and patronage will continue to be impacted by whatever the future you know we're all going through that future operating model discussion and the balance between home working and not home working and all the rest of it. I mean, the bottom line is transport infrastructure will still be required. I think we've just got to reimagine that territory as operators, as investors, as commissioners um, in this environment, because, you know, whilst we may continue with <clears throat> some significant volumes of home working for the long run, we're also trying to reimagine our places and our towns and our neighborhoods as destinations of choice, we're trying to get livability, uh, residential growth objectives delivered. And crucially, we're trying to get our hospitality, our leisure, cultural attractions very much back on their feet, including the one you can <laughs> see in the picture um, behind me here, which have all suffered the combined effects of, you know, 18 months worth of closure and lack of revenue. So I think transport and infrastructure to those things the fact people will work at home more often does not mean an end to mobility on public transport. And if anything, it means, I think, an increase in the potential of those sustainable modes for people being out and about for different purposes in the economy of the future as we try and reinvent town centres. So for me, it's a good time really to be having that conversation about the inclusive growth um, challenge in that respect. And I think you know, one of the curiosities of coming out of COVID is it's forcing us to kind of rethink everything. And, and, and this is as good an issue as any to spend our time on, I think. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Um, OK, Tim, um, back, back to you. Um, obviously, so we've, we've touched on this here, this, uh, and, and, you know, how the rail reforms might sort of affect um, the, the plea for kind of greater devolution. Um, uh, firstly, mm. you know, were you encouraged by, by the announcement? Do you, do you think setting up a new centralised state-owned body is potentially a step backwards? Um, and in general, I suppose, given how important devolution is to be able to deliver all sorts of local transport projects, not just rail, um, how encouraged are you by recent conversations with the government? Um, or, or, you know, is the government listening harder now or is there still a way to go? I'd say there's a there's a there's a wider recognition. There's certainly a wider recognition of the importance of the local voice and the regional voice, and that that is something that's really changed. I think in the five years that that TFN has been in place, and and some of that's been about our influence, and some of it's been about actually actually places themselves having a, having a much stronger have a much stronger voice, um, and that and the metro mayors have played a big role in the. Uh, in particular in the city regions in, in really sort of articulating that voice and, and the need to be involved not only in not only as a stakeholder but actually directly involved in decisions both about both about services and about franchises so i think that 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 recognition of the of 
of the local of the local role or co does come through really strongly in 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 what we saw yesterday um and that side of it aligned with all the the sort of structural reform that that we've already talked about feels really encouraging so i think we we do see this as a huge huge opportunity now to really start to plan um uh, uh the uh, for the rail network as, uh, uh, as a single as a single whole over a long period of time to integrate with everything that that the north has said that it needs over the next 30 years um through our strategic transport plan um but also to be able to do that local integration so yeah i think there's i think there's lots to welcome it's very light on two things really is that the the um the uh report that came out yesterday is very light on how that will happen uh, and there's a lot of reference to to actually retaining the existing regional structure in in network rail um mm -hmm. and that 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 worries us a little bit because a lot of what's going on in the north and a lot of what it's been about has been about that east-west connectivity um uh, and for, and and having to then join up between two separate two separate sub parts of network rail means that who's who's really looking after and is it is accountable for um the east west connectivity um and how that when you look at the key pinch points on the net on the rail network in the north they are broadly east west so the castleford corridor in manchester uh the capacity pinch points in at leeds um at sheffield to an extent um uh, uh, uh so both operationally and in terms of future infrastructure who's really doing that joining up across the north plus the plus the how what does this mean for rail north um and the work that we've done today to date to get some real accountability uh, and ownership of, uh, of 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 services in the north through through what was previously the franchises so yeah lots lots to welcome lots of questions still i think i think what we've heard from government over the last 48 hours has been really encouraging um but yeah we're, we're, we need to see the detail we need to work with government on the detail um and sitting behind this is the integrated rail plan which which was due to be published last december was is the is the vehicle for giving us the the certainty um particularly around northern powers rail and hs2 but actually around all rail investment in the north because it's it's really going to be the integrated rail plan that sets that long-term view from government about what they see as the as the appropriate long-term capital envelope to set and until the irp emerges we, we just we tfn doesn't have the ability to move northern power rail forward um I, 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 network rail network rail are starting work on transpanine route upgrade but that is still a a uh you know a delayed major program of a badly needed program investment that we're, that we're still waiting for and we're still waiting to understand a how that program will finish when it will finish um how it'll be integrated in with um npr and hs2 um um and all sorts of other things everything every we got, we're, we're in real danger now that actually that that the, the absence of the IRP and and what the, what could be uh, you know a focus on um, uh, rearranging the deck chairs means that actually we get we get more um, uh, we get uh, sorry we we get we get we run into a into a sort of stasis period at a time when we really need to be moving forward. So the sooner we get the integrated rail plan, the better. Um, but and then we can and then we can really start to to make really significant progress okay thanks tim okay um uh, hans i'd like to ask a, a question about um you know more generally transport connectivity linking to economic regeneration sort of local particularly how it all relates into large town center regeneration projects um, we heard from Tom earlier about all the stuff that's going on in, in Salford and how he's sort of linking pedestrian flows and, and public transport access in there. Um, you've, you guys have got, uh, you've got Times Square among other schemes. How have you thought through um, flows of, of people and vehicles, et cetera, um, to really kind of unlock that scheme and, and, you know, and ensure that there's no congestion, but also people can kind of free, freely get in? 
I think that's some of the stuff I was, I was mentioning before about so what we worked out with Warrington, we're over 70% car dependent. When we sort of did the proper study on it, it was because people didn't have a choice to move around the town to get to places you needed to get to. You had to use a car. There was no other options. And that's what we're trying to change and starting with making a change on that. But when we really looked into it, it came up to the 1980s when we had the new town development sort of thing. And lots of houses were built, but the infrastructure didn't, didn't follow. So it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't actually taken all the way through. And what we're doing now is when any new developments, when we're doing looking at the plans, infrastructure is a major part of it. So we're saying people's going to live somewhere, but where are they going to work? Where are the children going to school? Where are they going to get the leisure? And then how are they going to get there? So not only where are they going to go, but putting the infrastructure in so you can move around the town to say, actually, we're going to, people are going to live at one point A, but they want to go to uh, C, D and E. To, to make sure they have a quality of life. So they want some leisure time, they want some work time, and they need to get the children to school. So how does all that fit in together? But the, the old planning systems didn't seem to allow that. It built houses, but then never thought, where are we going to go afterwards? So that's what we've sort of changed with our planning structure. So we have planning, and then we have our planning uh, and infrastructure alongside it. So it's not separate. It's, it's, it's a part of the same thing to make sure all new developments, we sort of thought through where people are going, where people are going to be moving in the town. The town opening the town centre, and that's where we have the, the, the first and last mile initiatives there to make sure people don't need to, so they can choose not to and have an healthier lifestyle and re actually reduce congestion by using public transport for further, for further journeys. But if you, if you were in a mile of it, you could probably walk into town, you could cycle into town quite easily and take the facilities and take, take a pleasure of the facilities that's there. But we're also investing in the town centre itself to make sure that's an attractive place to want to come to. And uh, in the around, surrounding area, you can work in Warrington and have leisure time without having to leave the town centre because there's lots, there's lots of things to do there with the, with the new uh, social thing we're putting on there, the new cinema, the new buildings we're putting up there, new office spaces, and also the, the sort of uh, new uh, leisure places, so new, new places to go and eat and, uh, and entertain, entertainment there. So it's all in the town centre, you don't need to move out. And that's where it links in together. Our trail connectivity is important to us, so you can actually move in and out of so you, you can walk to the train station or you can cycle to the train station and get to jobs out further afield so you can get to liverpool you can get to manchester and even to london quick quickly and, and, and effectively and then come back to your town and what we're trying to do is retain the skills we've got in the town and make sure people don't need to leave in order to progress their, their sort of their careers or their ambitions you can stick actually say keep your income keep your skills within warrington and you don't have to leave to, to progress yourself that's the sort of thing we're looking at. There's lots of other schemes that we can talk about. Uh, the electrical system we're trying to get, which we've got a bid in for electric bus, all the electric bus town. We think we failed on the, the first bid we put in. We're, we're unsure why. We, we thought, obviously, like every town does, we thought we'd be able to be a good scheme there. But I think I'm going to borrow something what Tom said uh, earlier when he's on about the tale of two cities. Warrington's a tale of two towns because uh, economically we punch well above our weights in the private sector. So we're very, very business minded and, and actually good at uh, generating income through businesses privately. But public sector, we're one of the poorest funded public sector of towns in, in the northwest. So it's a tale of two towns there. So public funding with, with, with sort of on, on one of the lowest funded. And then that way we perform in the private sector, we, we also punch well above our weight with that size. So it's, there's a contrast there. And I just wanted to make a comment to what, what uh, Tim was on, was on about the uh, with the wider structures of the rail rail movements there and again it's a tale of two, two places it's the south and the north and i think from what we saw what was the government announcing what it was what it was short on was where the transport for the north fitted in all the skills and experience over the time where does that fit in to use the transport for the north expertise in developing these these uh, the new plans a new way of working but also where does the funding come in what we've ad what I've been noticing is that a lot of it comes not with the experts on the rail and and the transport movement, but what the treasuries are willing to fund. It comes back down to there's somebody in the background who we don't see, we don't negotiate with, we don't talk to, but really are the ones who are steering, are steering the boat, and that's the finances. So we can have the best ideas in the world how to change things, but unless it's funded set centrally, it won't happen. Or it won't happen the way we need it to happen, and I think that's that's some of the things that's been a bit frustrating. 
and that's why we're sort of look, looking for the announcements from government to say what we can and can't do. We know what's needed with the compromise and the transfer to the north, we compromise deals with each other. So we, we know we know we're not going to get exactly what we wanted, but we saw is it workable? And if we can work, work amongst ourselves the best possible plans. But with the north, is uh, are we going to get the, the, infra the new infrastructure and the funding really needed? Is the treasury going to take their hands off, off the purse strings and let us have some of the funding we needed? And it's not equally enough we need for the north and south. It's actually we should we should be investing more. We need more than our equal share to eat to eat to even up. So we, we sort of uh, investments in the south of, of, the, of the country seem to be getting the lion's share of any funding and new infrastructure and they've only got one pot of funding when it comes to the north we, we've got what's left and make do amend with, with, with what with what the treasure willing to release i don't want to be controversial on that but i have mentioned it a few times i think that's sort of summarizing my views on what's happening with, with, with this the transfer of infrastructure and also impacts on towns like Warrington, what we're trying to do are achieving <coughs> Salford and, and, and all the, the actual Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, all, all, our, all our hopes and aspir aspirations for our constituents depends on people who, who's not, who are sort of not with, within our debate. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, Hans, I think, um, yeah, certainly this, um, let, let's talk a bit more about this uh, funding issue. This is a, a, a rail, I think this is a network rail runs a, a government initiative, isn't it, to um, basically better focus the government's public investment um, projects um, on, you know, where, where the money's needed. And uh, I mean, I'm not sure how closely it's been linked up to sort of the levelling up pot and that wider decentralisation agenda. And, you know, lots has been um, announced in the past six months about that and the, the levelling up fund. We're, we're, we're starting to see a few more bids coming in there. Clearly, this is really crucial for all transport projects going on in the north. Um, have you noticed from your experience Project Speed having any positive effects on the developments and plans which are being discussed here? I mean, in a lot of ways, the, the ethos of Speed is the, is the right thing to be talking about, which is, you know, it's all about speeding up the um, delivery of schemes and particularly, I think, enhancing, if you look at it from an inclusivity perspective, enhancing the role of SMEs in the delivery of um, infrastructure projects and all of the benefits that can bring to our local talent pools going back to Hans's point I think has got potential written all over it but I do think it goes back to the kind of tale of two cities or tale of two towns or whatever we might want to call it by agreement Hans it's almost a tale of two regions really um without us wanting to kind of politicize the kind of north south line too much but I do think you know speed will have most effect if it's backed by additional infrastructure funding to enable us to deliver the enhancement of that more rapid end-to-end -end, um, procurement and delivery and the more rapid expansion of the SME supply chain in and around this. And lots of us, whether it's in transport and infrastructure or in resi growth, have, have, have talked about that time and again. And, and often it's not the willingness, but it is actually the capacity funding to be able to um, you know, put behind those schemes and their more rapid um, delivery that is, I think, the key issue. So I do think, you know, the, the, the fundamental point in all of this is um, we've got to be very careful about, I think, holding government's feet to the fire in the right constructive ways on all of these things, on the rail changes, on project speeds and all, all of the um, equivalent programmes to say, um, you know, in much the same way as we're saying in our entirely separate debates about the reorganisation of the health service at the moment, um, the changes to commissioning and contracting and organisation and so on are one thing, but if funding doesn't follow to properly address the levelling up agenda, um, we'll, we'll be having the same conversations in five to ten years' time. And my my worry, um, and my ambition, really, from a Salford GM perspective, from a Northern perspective, is that we, um, you know, we'll work our socks off to try and form all of the local partnerships that enable us to deliver that but you know government is fond of talking about nationally significant infrastructure schemes in you know how it allocates funding and how it procures and how it delivers and the transport and infrastructure needs of the north and of the northwest of england in particular have been um you know crying out for that nationally significant um so i think on the back of some of those 
commissioning, um, reorganization, structural changes. There's a there's a golden opportunity now to redress that balance, and hopefully that will bring, you know, a good benefit through initiatives like Project Speed in the long run to exactly those SMEs and local supply chains and the skills of local people that, you know, people like Hans and I and I'm sure Tim and others as well are so are so concerned about in our renewal programs. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. While you're speaking, um, another audience question. Um, asking at what stage is the potential Metrolink, Metrolink extension towards Sulphur City um, discussed? Um, I'm not quite sure what, what's meant by the end of that question, but at what stage is it at, I think? Um, well, it's a, it's, a, um, it, it's a reasonably advanced stage, and we're obviously in a discussion with um, TFGM about prioritisation and so on. But I think as one of the next significant bits of the growth and expansion of the um, Metrolink infrastructure it is seen as something that will um, really push much further on the exploitation of the growth potential of the job creation we've got in and around the Keys, in and around the Crescent and in and around the hospital. So, um, you know, Metrolink, new Metrolink lines, as we all know, with Trafford extensions, as we saw with the extensions to the east of Manchester over the years are 10 to 15 year projects aren't they and they do require national funding as well as us getting our ducks in a row in gm but i think it's one of those candidate schemes for greater manchester that's got potential written all over it mainly because the node at the end of it in other words in the keys in the crescent in particular as i mentioned in my talk earlier um these are not pipe dreams you know these are things that are happening on the ground now we're developing sites out we're releasing land We've got a huge delivery infrastructure, funded delivery structure with ECF and others behind everything that's happening on the ground now in and around the university and, and, and Salford Crescent. So, you know, they 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 become, I would hope, <laughs> more inevitable over time. But, you know, we are here to kind of agitate for that and to have that um, uh, conversation with um, colleagues across Manchester and beyond and otherwise. But you know, if anybody wants to come and talk to me about that being that particular piece of the Metrolink infrastructure being a nationally significant infrastructure project, it'll only take me a couple of minutes to convince them, I'm sure. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Good luck with that, um, Tom. Um, just uh, I, I'm aware we have we have talked about the, the, the National Rail announcement a lot today, but then we also have a lot of rail projects going on among you know but by all of you um speakers so um, there's another question from phil marsden about how does the panel see the station management teams recommended in the william chaps review being led um i think also that that perhaps sparks a wider conversation about sort of station in, in infrastructure management more generally um this week we had um the station collapse in northwich which i'm sure everyone saw um, on the news so you know what needs to be done to avoid infrastructure failures such as that and you know could the william shapps rev review uh, recommendations um help that um tim do you perhaps want to tackle that one if unless andy wants to but i'm not sure if he's I mean, it comes back to what's at the very start in terms of the devil being in, in, in the detail. I touched on fragmentation. Um, I think speak in the, in the Liverpool City region where we've done a lot of work in terms of looking at taking over 99 year leases of stations and whether that was the right thing to do from Network Rail. I, I think it, it's fair to say that we had challenges, particularly in terms of, um, and I will say it sounds good, understanding the assets and the risks associated with the assets and where those risks would sit. I think for me, it's seeing how that how the work developed over the next the next couple of years. It, 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 the, the principle has to be. I mean, I'm I'm really supportive, particularly in terms of major stations where we have, you know, I, I take Birmingham New Street for example, where I, I recall being at a presentation about it was about a year ago with the, the, uh, Birmingham New Street, where to, to to manage Birmingham New Street in terms of people on platforms and managing customers, it was four times as many as it would need if there was just one body managing the station. It was network rail, there was train operator staffs as well, and that caused challenge. So without getting too much into perhaps the the, uh, the infrastructure of the stations, I'll leave perhaps that to my, my, my colleagues. I think it's fair to say through the, through the review that's gonna take place, it, that is just one area of efficiency that needs to be looked at to make sure that we get the biggest bang for the buck. And that's just on the people side of it. 
one thing I, I would say, and it's probably just diverting a bit, but it's something that that I'm really cognizant of in terms of the rail review, is this: whilst the ideas are, are great, there's lots of work to be done. We can't lose sight of the fact that it will affect individuals. There's individuals that have read that report, consider even people at staff stations, etc. And so we need to sort of be aware of that, and we need to get some more detail behind it clarity behind it to be able to give some some assurance where it can be to people and organizations that, that are are affected but my final comment before probably a segue into perhaps say tim or tim to talk more about the stations themselves is that we found certainly that at least one of our stations on network liverpool south parkway on the mersey network which would integrates with, with many other operators is that we are the we are the owner of that station. Mersey Travel owned the station. We operated one single operator responsible for the maintenance of it um, and all to do it. And it works really, really well because you can strip away the down to one accountable body, which is ourselves to deliver. And if you just take that as just a, a template, the principle of what's being looked at, it does work. But it's about it's about organisations. And I will say in terms of uh, local authorities, notwithstanding the risk and the management of, of risk of it and actually grasping it and taking taking ownership of it and actually uh, being responsible for delivery themselves mm -hmm. it's an opportunity and must be seen as such so apologies if i've rambled a bit but i did i'm not i say station infrastructure isn't my area of expertise but the principles are, as a rail operator is very much about the fact that one person should be operating and all responsibilities should be encapsulated under the one body Thanks, Andy. And yes, yeah, sorry about the technical um, issues you were having um, no and um, and that you haven't had a, a greater chance to, to answer some of the other questions. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, but uh, we, we do have to wrap up soon. But um, I, I've got one question for hands. Uh, but Tim, did you want to have a one minute uh, response on this on this infrastructure question um, before? I, I, I think Andy, actually, I think Andy said it really well. I think that, okay. that local having clear accountability ownership and the integration so the integration point absolutely about both operationally in terms of asset management it is really important really really important but it but it also speaks to the conversation we had earlier about funding planning designing you know stations are no better example of where you need everything to come together locally um uh, and the opportunity of getting it right and uh, particularly more into that actually um uh there's huge opportunities to really affect transformational change if you can get it right but it, but that only works if it's planned locally um uh and delivered locally and and into and, and done in a very integrated way and the challenge we've got is still that government is carving its budgets up into separate pots and doing it different and uh, um and not thinking holistically in terms of the funding so the green the green book the new green books huge step forward and all of that makes all of that integration and thinking holistically about infrastructure investment possible what we now need is a, is a shift in decision making um uh and then sequencing and phasing of projects to really follow that same pattern as well Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, Hans, um, I've got about one minute <laughs> to ask you um, something, and I think I'd like to ask ask it because I think it's also a very good uh, intro into our next panel session, uh, which is going to look a little bit more in detail about sort of greening transport and some of the things that Tom spoke about in his presentation. We've got a couple of questions from the audience, which are about you know, preparing for the end of traditional fuel stations, or at least sort of phasing them out and bringing in EV charging points, etc. Is this something that you're looking at in terms of the regeneration schemes in Warrington? And, um, you know, how, how challenging uh, do you think this is going to be to incorporate those points into plans? I think it's, it's, it's a big challenge because what we're trying to do, we've all, we're trying to get all our car parks to, 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 to say some, have some charging points attached to them. But the practicalities and the cost of trying to do to do that, I think one we're looking at a local um, car park was was just we're just actually re refurbishing now, and it's going to cost uh, quite a lot of money, or, or millions of pounds, to try and put the uh, to to get the power there to, to actually be able to have the charging points in. It, we we wasn't able to do it on this occasion, but we are looking to do it in the future. But we are looking to try and make sure that all, all over the town we we can have adequate charging points for people, knowing that. If, in the near future 
that's going to be the main main the source of the the power to, to get people moving so the that's the saying is uh, we need to be investing in this r- right now i think the new bus depot we sort of didn't quite get the, the bid we we're looking for from government but we, we still have to plan which costs more to make sure we can put the eventuality of, of there so actually future proof it to make sure that the electric charging points for the bus bus new bus depot we're building can be actually put put there in place ready ready for when it does come in into place at present we're still having to put diesel fuel tanks in there as well as we'd sooner have just put the electric points in there it's going to be a massive challenge for all towns like big big and small there is to make sure that people have enough charging points to make sure they, they can meet the, the growing needs that the population is going to have bear in mind i think they said in 10 9 10 years time they're going to be all new cars are, are going to be electric so where they're going to be charged is, is going to be something a massive job that everyone's got to put in place and i come back to the funding side of things again how are they going to be funded yeah exactly okay great thanks hans so i'm afraid that's all we've got time for um but you know we've got plenty of time in the second panel to discuss all of this in more detail so a virtual round of applause to our speakers for a really thorough conversation and to our attendees as well for your questions um we've got about uh, 15 20 minutes now of networking and we'll be back for the second half panel and presentation at 11 25 11 30. Um, So if we could switch to networking mode now, please. Thank you all again and see you shortly. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us again on the main stage. Hope you've had a good bit of networking the last 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, So before our second panel, um, we've got another presentation now um, from Ernst Terhorst, Associate at Architectural Studio Field in Clegg Bradley, which is designing several integrated transport and property projects across the Northwest. So um, welcome to Ernst. If you are there, if you could turn your camera on and everything and um, and then the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi, Ernst. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi, welcome. Yes, I was just uh, just uh, introducing um, introducing your presentation and um, and saying that you, you you're, you're going to be so giving us a bit of an overview about the work that you're doing and your practice of doing in the northwest and um, particularly with regard um, you know uh, you know moving towards sustainable forms of transport and really helping to sort of improve livability and mobility um, in town centre projects and, and others. So I will give you the floor. Fantastic, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for being with us. Yeah, no, um, uh, I'm I'm been living in Stratford 15 years and and, and I've called Manchester my home for for over 20 odd, um, and yeah, privileged to work in a few different master plan areas and and um, met all of which are of course very heavily influenced by infrastructure. Um, I put this slide in just for the benefit of a wider panel as well in terms of. Um, work that's ongoing in um, Port Salford, which we mentioned earlier, the Superport in Liverpool, the role of the, um, the Great Ship Canal, um, and in particular, I was going to focus on today, Stretford. And I just thought I'd put in some sort of provocative pieces to discuss, really, um, uh, in, in the wider context, what we're dealing with here. And um, we're, we're in a world where vehicle licensing, you know, number of vehicles on the roads is increasing for, for ever more, uh, whereas the number of roads, of course, is not, um, and transport costs for cars is actually going down. And, and perhaps through COVID, that's that's perhaps exacerbated slightly. We, we do need to get people back on to public transport. And in just before, actually, we, you know, we, we we were quite aware that we had a big air quality problem. Um, that that journeys through residential streets are increasing massively. That our health and well-being was suffering. And actually. Um, that that's a big national issue um and you know perhaps it was a, is a good thing that we were able to stop um and and reflect on where we were in the world and and what 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 what, what our priority should be um and in, in, in a place where actually you know 30 to 40 percent of us don't actually own a car with trafford the the project that we're going to be talking about actually has quite a high per capita ownership um how, how does that fit in um and how can we reinvent ourselves uh, in, a, in a very changed world where we've kind of accelerated 10 years into the future in, in the course of a few months. Now, as everyone will know, there's been a number of positive streams of funding that have come about um, slightly haphazardly in some cases, but in, in, in really positive other ways. Um, and I think GM's kind of led that really well um, 
in terms of creating an overall vision for cycling and walking and and many of the other facets of, of moving and getting around um yeah I'm, I, in my mind i'm talking about people and how we get about uh, i think anthony is going to be talking very much as well about strategic freight and transport of of work and 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 goods and so on uh, which would be really fascinating to understand as well we've seen um in parallel with that uh, a, a significant funding boost for high streets which of course have to completely reimagine themselves now where um that the summer are in real trouble and my local center where i live um has suffered um recently you know with, with a a, a mall development in this what was historically a, a street where the car was subservient to the person um, which had character and identity which perhaps has, has kind of gone you know it's an arterial road now um, I count uh, at the moment about um, seven lanes uh, down Chester Road um, which creates its local issues um, I'm, I'm actually Dutch originally um, born born in amsterdam um but fully anglicized now um sort of beaten into me um but uh, what I, I i didn't realize until i was doing a bit of research just now is that in 1972 there was some protests in in the netherlands about creating people streets and and after a few children uh, were killed and there was a movement towards a, a, a new kind of cycling culture where there didn't exist one at all at the same time in Stratford and I think many other parts of the country that in the UK um, and this is of course not uh, pl applicable across every every part of the UK but there in, in the case of Stratford Arndale and there was a number of Arndales all over the UK there was a movement for an American model which was a big retail mall um, and, 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 and room for the car um, now that that of course was very successful and actually you know Muhammad Ali opened the mall it was one of the first indoor malls in the UK and, and decades of success there but actually it never really was connected with the local community um, and and that that's created a lot of problems that we can have and opportunities that we can try and resolve and, and, and repair um, and and I always find this this image fascinating of, of, of old Stretford um, with you know Victorian grain and character, uh, narrower streets, um, and 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 taking trying to take a view of of something very similar. Um, so you can see St Matthew's Church at the bottom. So um, two two problems. One is the sort of divisive uh, wide roads. Um, we are well connected here in this location. Um, and, and the other problem in, in this case, and, and perhaps in many local centres, is this kind of legacy of b large box retail, and, and what do we do with that empty um, space? And and he la expansive car parking, um, and, and and multi whether that be multi-storey or surface, particularly multi uh, uh, surface car parking, um, and a, a, a retail world that does need to change and become more interesting and become really compete with our sofas and how easy it is to shop and and you know leisure and entertain ourselves at home and is to create something that's very very attractive um and, and and brings you out 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 of home and actually to mix and meet people again which i'm sure we're all looking forward to how do we do that um there's a number of different strands um and, and and there's a number of different approaches um we, we like to very much learn i i don't think i've ever stopped learning and i don't think i really know much still <laughs> but um yeah there, there's a couple of really good examples that one's really interesting at the moment east street in, in bedminster in, in bristol on the right um and of course walthamstow um in terms of how that that's really led the the charge since 2013 with 20 million pounds of funding we've also got incredible places in in here you know like any unlike anywhere else uh, in well, in stretford but in the uk of incredible historic character everywhere we go this is a hidden little gem of uh, called trafford grove um, 10 meters face to face tight streets no cars on the road it's it's been done before 100 years ago actually and, and it still works in some cases and we, you know we'd, we'd love to reinterpret that as a modern piece uh, what's another really important strand? It's it's to co-create. It's it's to really fundamentally listen and make people involved. Um, and we've we've been doing this uh, both live, but actually through a really troubled time, of course, through COVID, which has been a bit more difficult. But online, and and that's also been a success um, as well. Um, this is a, a wonderful um, 
drawing that was made during the last uh, public consultation that was in face to face um a, a graphic artist who, who drew this as 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 the consultation was going and kind of listened in with her ear and started drawing things um and really you know i think we were trying to get this sort of philosophy of this is my idea from from as in not me ernst but actually uh, the local people felt that this is their idea in a way what i found really difficult um and, and fascinating as well was actually i, sh I couldn't pre judge um, um an outcome or, or or an idea actually genuinely um let the the local consensus and, and feeling drive proposals and and influence them and, and i was an enabler not um i suppose a archetypal designer in in, in that instance it, it's not quite true of course you do need to interpret things um fundamentally partnerships absolutely vital you know and and stretford uh, fortunately is brimming with community uh, entrepreneurs and and the proactive council and and indeed uh, developer partner Bruntwood. Um, identity is, is a, a, like again a, a rich swathe of history, and this is actually former King Street, the High Street of Stratford before the Mall came. Um, independent led, characterful, um, intimate. So, uh, what what how do we how do we a, a approach uh, to a reinvention of Stratford now? Um, a partnership was created, like I mentioned, with Bruntwood, a joint venture with 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 the council, and you see that with Muse and Salford and many other successful ventures around the country. It's a wonderful model, and and um, it, it balances social value and um, the the wider infrastructure, strategic infrastructure opportunities, um, with a developer analysis and, and expertise and 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 being able to move promptly. Um, it was really important that we did think uh, strategically. Uh, an area action plan was set up, um, which um, was its goal to to really look at the wider neighbourhood to stitch it into um, a future high street funded of 17.6 million uh, success last year, which is great news, to completely re reinvigorate the mall. Now, of course, that would, of course, um, set things in motion. Um, now, over, over, we're already 18 months into consultation and engagement. It, it's still ongoing. It's going to be ongoing for probably years to come, actually, because of a number of different facets of this project come forward. Um, and um, we, we've, we've so far um, plucked out a series of vision objectives listed here um, from the people um, and, and from, from our, our analysis to date. And, and, and really, it's really important for those visions um, are, are embedded in a, in a walkable place so far designed around people getting through Stretford, but actually being cognizant of, of being able to need meet the needs of people in Stretford. And, and um, but it's, it's I think what's really in topic in, of, of interest to discuss is how do we balance that need with phenomenal number of car users? and the people wanting to walk through their neighborhood uh, can the both actually ever be met question so one for you anthony um so very quickly um how, you know how do we approach that perhaps this maybe I, i'm doing this the wrong way around but it actually it's the way it might end up where where this kind of catalyst in this a joint ownership of a large asset in the center of stratford might catalyze a series of moves out and and create connections out create uh, in, around a new central green space to acknowledge and embrace new uh, cycling and walking walking routes heritage assets in yellow there and then a series of further connections are made now of course there's other strategic overlays here that are happening at the commensurate and at the same time with this which is really fascinating to look at as well and we must dovetail with um but yeah i quite like the i've just done a quick diagram here quite crude but it just sort of how it creates vibrancy and animation as we work through it and we're working with partners such as trafford housing trust here as well and many other stakeholders to to develop um you know refresh some of their thinking and prompt them into thinking new new ideas so what how does that translate into something on the ground looking closer in 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 our emerging proposals um a, a vision for this is 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 i think the word is diversity um you know i think um ibram den spoke really well about this a few months ago um from legal in general and uh, head of retail and, and you know it really is di about diversity we, we, it, we need new homes um that there's too much retail we need probably twice as much retail in half the floor area and we need fundamentally affordable homes um, I think Tom was speaking about that as well in terms of the affordable and social objectives must be really addressed and, and come to the fore and it needs to be a place where we all want to be 
and, and streets uh, for people. Um, and what's the opportunity? Well, there's a there's a big one, and and this is a plick again. Hopefully, it's interesting to discuss this across not just this project, but there's there's a huge amount of surface car parking, a, a great sponge of a car park uh, that's un, unused really, um, that that could could really create a real opportunity to unlock the wider site. It has a, for not you know a significant embodied carbon. We've developed a, a, an FCBS carbon tool that you can anyone can free use. To, to assess how much carbon is embodied within existing buildings and proposed buildings. It's a gift as well, and we should really try and make use of it, but bring it freshly back to life. Uh, you know, Q parks are, are, are very good at, at doing this, and, and, and we do need to address and maintain car usage. So I'll quickly run through how that might transform one and a half football pitches of new public open space, um, a gentle density, a vibrant, a uh, new high street, um, connected, walkable, um, and, and, and a really a great experience, memorable experience where surface car parks might be you know, reinterpreted as, as, as play streets where we can create a little bit more density with tighter grain streets, which don't need to have car parking on them and actually consolidate that uh, around the site. Um, and create really what well, you know. I think some of the narrow streets actually are, are some of the most intimate and, and wonderful to experience as well. We've got a wonderful Bridgewater Canal um, um, to take take advantage of, which has been turned its back on also. And and how could that be um, reimagined? And you know something like the Bridge Pub in Sale or Duke's ninety two, something like that could really uh, succeed here and create a wonderful journey of waterside leisure right the way to the high street and to the centre of, of Stratford. We also, you know, I think we're seeing this across the country as well as, as a trend, existing car storage. What do we do with these outdated but, but significant car parking structures? Could we actually diversify them, create rooftop um, edible uh, gardens, uh, ground floor retail? Uh, that's the end of my my little piece. Um, and, and this slide, Sarah, is sort of a prompt for the, for the next discussion. Great. Thank you, Ernst. That was a really, really good uh, presentation loads of fascinating stuff in there and particularly linking connectivity and with like retail and the need to create a more experiential offer from our destinations to bring people in and clearly you know transport travel mobility all plays a massive role in that so our second panel discussion now will be about transport for growth both at a local and regional level and how to create a more sustainable travel infrastructure in the years to come so as ever please keep your questions flowing from the floor um, and I'd now like to welcome to the stage Anthony Hatton, Director of Strategic Projects at PLL LNP, Claire Hay, Chief Executive at Greener Transport Solutions, Councillor John Blundell, Cabinet Member for a Thriving Economy at Rochdale Council, and Ernst, Associate at Field and Clegg Bradley. So welcome to our speakers, and if you could all activate your cameras and mics if you haven't done so already. Hi, everyone. Morning, Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start by asking everyone to very briefly, <laughs> one or two minutes each, just um, outline some of the, the projects they're working on at the moment, because you're all doing quite a lot of very different stuff. So I think it'd be helpful to our audience to sort of just hear about one or two projects that you're working on. Um, Anthony, do you want to start? You're doing kind of almost the, the opposite end of what Ernst has been describing. You, you're doing this sort of large scale infrastructure um, projects really aren't you in the region? Thank you yes I'll touch on a few others that sort of pick up on what some has said as well that I can't claim credit for but colleagues are working on. Uh, so firstly if you look at the slides that Ernst showed you saw the Bridgewater Canal um, going through the middle of Stretford. There's been a lot of work going on over the years working with all the councils so that to get the Bridgewater Way uh, upgraded to the point where it is now you know very well used as a cycle way and pedestrian way uh, both through Trafford and through Wigan, Salford uh, and beyond. So getting that whole stretch of that path uh, up and running again for both leisure and commuter use. So uh, often used, particularly in the Trafford stretch, for people cycling into Manchester. One of the projects that's being worked on there is solving one of the missing links. That is the crossing of the Manchester Ship Canal, where the swing bridge at Barton has been a barrier. Uh, and there's a project in the public domain that we're working on with colleagues uh, the, the ship canal and uh, both the councils as well to try and bring forwards uh, to get that connection sorted uh, that that's in the public domain and uh, going through planning at the moment so that hopefully will create the the link from Salford to Trafford 
and, and solve one of those uh, barriers to people adopting uh, cycling for commuting more than they have done already. Um, also importantly for that is the link to the uh, Garden Bridgewater that we heard about earlier from Tom, uh, upgrades to the path so that people can access you know, major visitor attractions uh, such as that um, using that sustainable transport. So you don't have to get in your car to go to the garden, you can uh, go down the Bridgewater Canal to get there. On a wider front, freight, uh, as Ernst mentioned earlier, um, we've got to remember this is a global business, uh, so there's obviously links to port and airports in that context. Uh, but the main project that's uh, progressing at the moment on Port Salford is the rail terminal. Uh, that has been in the pipeline for quite some time, getting very close to financial close on that, with the hope that Spades will go beyond what's happening in enabling works at the moment into building that rail terminal starting later this year. And that will provide a link onto the national rail network, provide a connection to the port of Liverpool and other ports around the country to get more uh, freight off the roads and, and connected into that uh, vital infrastructure. So linking on the conversation earlier about rail, we mustn't forget the capacity that's needed because more and more people are focused on getting freight onto the rail network. There's quite a few rail freight interchanges around the country that are popping up, but those will only be successful if there's enough capacity on the railways to allow these freight trains to move, not just at night, but also during the day because of the use of the, the rail infrastructure, the, the assets that are the trains and their ability to connect up and down the country uh, to the ports and between areas of the country. Um, last but not least also the, the highways point. So whether it's for, for people or for goods, um, the, the highways are absolutely vital components of connecting all these places. Um, the links to what the, the motorway network is doing for us is key. A couple of the areas where we've got key focus, one is around the Northwest Quadrant study. So this is the M60 linkage that's close to the, uh, the Port Salford scheme, close to the Worsley uh, connection. So there's lots of issues there that still are to be resolved. Uh, so we're working with TFGM, the councils, uh, and trying to uh, work with DFT and Highways England to keep that project moving. And also at the Liverpool end, uh, connections into uh, South Liverpool. Uh, so Liverpool Airport is, is there, but there's also a huge regeneration of land in the South Liverpool area where that is coming on. Major employers like Jaguar Land Rover, major pharmaceutical companies, um, all reliant on people and goods moving in that road network. So further infrastructure needed, building on the great uh, bridge that was created across the Mersey uh, that is now well underway. Brilliant. Thank you, Anthony. Really, really good overview of everything you're doing. Um, Claire, what about you? You're, you're working on a big decarbonisation manifesto, I believe, at the moment. Yes, no, thank you. And, and I'm really enjoying today, by, by the way. I've been learning a lot from the discussion. I'm really, really good event. Um, so delighted to be yeah. here. <laughs> um, I mean, yes, we're very much focusing, and I'm glad that you're moving the discussion a little bit on more to the sustainability and the green agenda, because that is very much where we're, where, what we're focusing on. I mean, transport is the fastest growing source of global greenhouse gas emissions. It's the biggest emitting sector in the UK. Um, so as hosts of the COP26 UN Climate Summit this year, we're going to need to have a a story, a good story to tell on transport. Um, really got to have an incredible plan. Um, and I mean, we, we set some targets. I mean, brilliantly, um, we've now set this target 78% reduction by 2035. That really puts the UK at the forefront in terms of ambition. Um, but of course, there's a very big difference between ambition and action. Um, and so we really are needing um, a plan now um, for how, how this is the UK is going to achieve these targets. Um, so Greener Transport Solutions, just briefly, it's a not-for-profit organisation dedicated to the decarbonisation of transport. And we've been doing a lot of stakeholder research and a lot of events and a lot of consultation looking at, you know, what does it really take to decarbonise transport? And what's absolutely clear is that achieving net zero um, is going to require a massive change. Every aspect, bluntly, of how we plan for transport is going to need to change. Um, so, so far, five key themes have emerged from our research, which I'll just briefly list, and obviously you can pick up more later in the discussion if it's of interest. But the first thing is that the, the decarbonisation of transport cannot occur without changes to the wider economy. So we need a whole systems approach, um, with, um, which reflects the shift to digital, co digital connectivity, um, and the integration of transport with land use planning, so much the subject for today, um, and energy, and of course, green finance, because funding is going to be key. 
Technical solutions will not be sufficient. We also need behavior change. I mean, two thirds of the future emissions reductions are going to rely on individual choices and behavior. So the hard stuff is yet to come. Thirdly, fares and taxes should encourage people to make lower carbon choices. I mean, at the moment, we, we, don't, we haven't got the price signals right the, the around the right way. That's a really important area. Um, but equally, we've got to ensure that the transition to um, net zero is fair and just. It's absolutely essential um, that access to es essential services you know, by transport, digital, or other means is available for all. And finally, and this is a big one, really important, we've got to strengthen devolution. Um, local areas need to be able to plan for housing, jobs and transport on an integrated long term basis. So we strongly believe that greater devolution will drive faster delivery um, of UK net zero targets. So that's that's where we're at at the moment. Thank you. OK, brilliant. Thanks, Claire. That's a yeah, really, really good intro to, um, to, to all of that. And a lot of these points we touched on in the first panel. And yeah, we're definitely hoping to explore more in this one. Um, uh, Councillor John. What about you? Rochdale's got a lot going on at the moment. Yeah, so um, a couple of years ago we launched our growth strategy, uh, which has lots of different things going on it, mainly two um, big ticket items, one of them being the Northern Gateway, which is um, you know, a big site which aims to be like a Trafford Park or a Manchester Airport, but in the north of the conurbation. Um, but more applicable to this session is the Rochdale Rail Corridor strategy, which is master planning around each of the borough stations. We have the um, Collardale Valley line running through the borough from Victoria through to Bradford. Um, and that line was built primarily to move goods and not people. So a lot of the land use around those stations are um, to do with, I mean, there was, there's, even, there's even a business that still fixes boats because it used to be next to the canal. Um, so a lot of when we talk about Trafford and uh, slides and it was showing people living around the stations, a lot of our land is still used for industrial purposes, but they, those people don't use the railway. So it's about flipping um, those businesses to more appropriate places on the motorway and trying to look, try to use our rail stations as a as a focal point for development. And that's about attracting and retaining young people. I went to the University of Manchester. Um, and I had not been a counsellor in Rochdale, I probably would have ended up living in South Manchester where the rest of my friends did at university because they don't see uh, the North Conurbation as somewhere viable to go and live or, or, or even part of um, Manchester. So the, the, the overarching strategy is to um, try and see our rail stations more as like a focal point rather than just for shifting people. Um, and and slides kind of did that very well, although they weren't around rail stations. It spoke about infrastructure as how people live and work around them, rather than just as a means of moving people. Um, and if we don't think of transport in that way, we're not going to build um, sustainable transport. R those railways and those roads have been there since the Victorians put them there. What has changed is what happens around them. Um, so. It, to the local planning authority really to um, you know look at what its assets are and how we, how we use them better if we're going to build a sustainable transport network but just to um, touch on two points one is uh, the post-covid situation what's that going to look like so like I just said you know transport isn't just about moving people off to rail stations and uh, the points where they connect to where people dwell and live or work what, what COVID is going to do is it's going to change that. It's going to change where point A and point B is, where people are choosing to live and where people um, have the option to work. So we need to make sure that the government continues to invest in rail and public transport services, although at the moment it looks like patronage is low because otherwise people will make detrimental decisions. They'll decide to go and live and, live and work in places that are more highway dependent because they're only going to make that journey twice a week than they are um, if they know they've got a reliable rail service. Um, and on that point, this kind of central view of um, what the transport and the FT and the wider. Um, we're also seeing a shift in how these things are funded. Um, and we, we do need greater devolution in this area. For example, when Greater Manchester first asked for devolution in 2014 and got it, um, we asked for control over our stations. That, 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 that led to our stations alliance of looking at changing area around railways but we've seen the new app going to a more centralized system 
uh, the way funding's been arriving at cities through the Leveling Up Fund or Future High Streets, um, or turn investment plans is a very top down way of delivering um, the plans that local areas have. And it, it's been a you know a seismic shift in the way the government's been behaving, more of a presidential style approach where you see Boris stood outside number 10, um, waving a fish around or whatever, whatever he's doing that week. Um, and he, we're starting to see this more, number 10 is controlling what's going on from the centre. And that's meaning we're not seeing deals and city deals where places and local areas can really say well what do we want to the shoot on um schemes and what's going on in their area into a set of objectives that are set by different funding pots and that makes things very complex um one might argue you get the same outcome because player is going to keep plugging the same things because that, that's what they're developing and trying to achieve um but it means it happens more slowly in a, in a less favourable way. I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, John. Yeah, we'll, we'll pick up on some of that and, and, and particularly what you've said about making stations more than just about a means to move people. It links to a lot of what Ernst was saying earlier. Um, Ernst, you've already told us sort of what you're working on at the moment. So I'm interested to get your view on, um, so looking at more sustainable forms of transport, reducing car usage and promoting walking and cycling. A lot of the, a lot of efforts were made at the height of the pandemic last year to, to really kind of promote that. Um, we had uh, B network trials. Um, I think you already mentioned that this, the road from kind of Altrincham Trafford area into Manchester city centre. And there was a lot of conflict then last year between car users and say cyclists, et cetera. What, what are the main challenges then to try and sort of nudge behaviour, change behaviour, like what Claire was saying needs to be done? You know, what are the practical challenges to that and how can, how can um, councils and their partners work to sort of smooth that, that tension over? Yeah, well, I think there's a few points. It's uh, fascinating to see on the ground. And, and John, you you and I spoke about it um, quite interestingly about that there is going to be a natural friction, isn't there? It's not going to happen overnight. It, 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 you've got a huge car usage and, and, and comfort in the car versus, you know, a, a limited uh, real estate of the road. Um, and how do you bring cy cycling, walking into that and, and, and greenery? Um, well, you have to reduce some of that road usage. You have to face up to the fact that some traffic will be created. Um, and that's a really difficult challenge. So it's not just recently, that's that's going to be something that's just going to be ongoing. And um, things such as the LTNs, uh, so low traffic neighborhoods, for instance, are, are kind of a facet of that where uh, you, you kind of get a very um, difficult uh, judgment to make where people really want to create walkable neighborhoods, but actually, people also want to be able to just drive anywhere they can so i've seen that firsthand in my local neighborhood it's a sort of 50 50 split and and, and uh, kind of uh, pitchforks and the like it's kind of it's, it's uh, uh, kind of yeah, very interesting so that that's a real challenge um but it's it's got to happen isn't it it's, people have got to get healthier and, and 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 we need to think intelligently and strategically i think anthony you, you've, you've got some ideas in terms of you know there is a reality that a number of, of uh, white van men, a number of transport logistics of, of whether it be materials and other uh, goods that keep our economy going, perhaps that's a real opportunity because Chester Road, for example, is make real analysis on that. What vehicles are using it for their own personal use? So we want to get those sorts of people who are commuting into the trams and into cycling and walking and make that much easier as a series of corridors, which is in train um there's a canal path as well thank you anthony that you know that we can easily cycle along um as well uh, but actually what i think what what i'm not super conversant with but interested in is those ideas of the final mile that um that anthony mentioned about of of, of pe perhaps creating nodes and centers um such as at the m60 junction or whether port salford and others where where we can reduce the 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 other car use that I don't often think about, which is about those kind of econ economy and, and material and so on needs. 
Okay, thanks, Ernst. Let's hear from Anthony now then. Um, uh, you know, is it realistic to talk about decarbonising the, the kinds of many of the kinds of schemes that you've been talking about that are happening on a, a on a sort of regional or even national level to really you know, really drive the economy and support all of the different strands of the economy and, and, and globalisation as well? Is it realistic? And um, you know, while also trying to, we've, we've had this question from the audience. How can transport be more joined up across the region? Can you both be joined up, have all of these different modes and also decarbonise? Uh, I think when it comes to freight in particular, you know, the, the key driver for any business is, is, is being able to make money at the end of the day. And if the alternatives don't work financially, uh, then they either need support or the business will work out a better solution. You know, whether it's buses or, or trucks, you don't want to be running empty buses or empty trucks. It doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense, and it's not good for the environment, it's not good for our use of energy. And um, so in the first instance, we have to create a network, as, as the question suggests, which is integrated, which does work to make sure that the, the, the use of the vehicles, the use of the assets is optimised to make sure that the economy, that the economics of it does work and it does support the economy and it does support the needs. As John said, people will adapt to the network that they see and choose to live in places that works for them. That's what happens in major cities. You know where you've got that good connectivity. The problem we've got in our cities is we're way behind the times. Uh, the metro link has been a fantastic asset for for Manchester, uh, but it doesn't go far enough. We need orbital routes. We need more connections. If you go to places like Melbourne, you know the network is extensive, where you don't need to get in your car because you can interchange on the tram above ground in the same way that in London you can interchange across other items. So we're on that journey. We need to keep investing in these forms of infrastructure. And when it comes to buses, yeah, they're a vital part of the network, whether it's guided busways or going down our streets in the same way. The other option in that context is also demand responsive transport. So trials like Arriva Click and the rollout in Liverpool and Leicester for those kind of solutions are an important part of bridging the gap between you know, the affordability of a taxi versus the challenge of, of the bus network and trying to get that compromise between what can work at all times of day when people need it. Now, if you think about industry, a lot of industries work 24-7. You know, there are shift workers trying to get places. Airports have people going to work well before the passengers get there. Um, and that applies across a lot of the economy. Uh, when it comes to the white man van, there's lots of talk about the retail sector. But actually, what about the people servicing industry, whether it's your plumbers, your electricians, the, the, the workers, the delivering of the parts uh, to, to keep things going, to keep industry going? Um, so we'll see that in Manchester with the air quality uh, plan that's happening at the moment there'll be an impact to that and for that uh, there will be a change in how different fleets are used so that ad adapting to that regulation will clearly bring a change but fundamentally it comes down to the energy question and what are the alternatives for, for small vehicles you know from e-scooters up to vans proof of electric electrification you know has is happening you know it's a rollout it's an economic question of what's the cost and of course there's the fundamental challenge of the resources can we get enough resources to make enough batteries, given the number of places we're talking about using batteries, given that is a finite resource on Earth. Um, the question of hydrogen comes into play, particularly when you're then talking about what else, going bigger than vans into HGVs, you know, that, that heavy density uh, that's needed in terms of how much energy can you carry in your vehicle really is where the challenge comes with HGVs. But then that's where we get into the rail network question. You know, the, the economy of using rail over HGVs is well understood in the industry. Um, as we move down the energy challenge, that dynamic will change. So what in the past was seen as a rule that you wouldn't move goods on the train network uh, before, you know, is changing as the cost of energy is changing and, and the dynamic around uh, taxing of air quality and taxing of carbon is changing. So that will all drive the changes. At the end of the day, it comes down to convenience. Um, if it's for the passenger, you know, the school run, the commute, at the end of the day, people are making decisions all the time. And if you look at that stretch through Stretford, you've got a canal where you can cycle and walk. You've got the Metrolink line running right down it and you've got the road. But people are choosing which uh, option to adopt based on a number of those factors. Changing working practices to be more flexible, to allow people to start their day later, will allow people to stretch the time and allow them more time to drop off the kids, to get on the bike, to get to work so long as you've got the facilities at the other end to change, to shower, to be in the right state of mind, to be there. As long as, of course, you've got enough time in the day to do your job and get back again to whatever you've got to do. 
So that, that is the balance we've got. At the end of the day, it all requires investment in the infrastructure to support each of those modes. And the Metrolink, as I said, is, is very successful, but if you go on that at certain times of the day, it is absolutely rammed. And in that context, uh, you know, it's a great sign of its success, but it also does lead to people's choices about whether they want to be on a very uh, lo loaded tram or whether they would get on their bike or indeed back in their car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, Anthony. Um, I was actually looking at this top question we've got from the audience about what construction materials can be used for future transport and infrastructure schemes that have reduced or, or zero embodied um, carbon. And you touched on that as well, actually, but the costs involved in that, I mean, how kind of realistic do you think that is? And have you got any ideas about that first question? It's a, it's, it, there's a huge amount of detail to go into in, in, in answering that question, but well, yeah, maybe say, quite a technical one. <laughs> yeah. Every industry is, is trying to solve the carbon challenge. And, and in steel, if you look at you know, the UK steel industry, um, you know, there is obviously recycling of existing steel which is using electricity. So it's not digging iron ore out the ground and, and uh, effectively processing it, which in historically is, is a very heavy energy intense uh, industry. But that recycling process allows you to use electricity in a way which um, you know, makes the decarbonization one that is entirely linked with decarbonizing electricity. Um, but that again leads to extra demands on where we get our electricity from and the network that that is, resolved, that it, that is uh, transmitted on. Um, when it comes to other materials, everybody's looking at their embodied uh, carbon in those materials and trying to find alternatives. But that's where I think we'll also see a change to different uh, different forms of transport as those numbers feed through to the costs. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Anthony. OK, um, Claire, coming back to you on, on this, um, there's actually I was going to ask about this. What lessons should be learned from other European cities to encourage active travel and linking back to what I asked, uh, asked Ernst earlier. Um, that's a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? Um, you know, how do you actually, how do you sort of resolve some of these conflicts from people on the ground, all the different sort of network users? Um, has there been anything in, in Europe, you know, any, any sort of trials that you think we should really look at um, as examples here? Well, I mean, there's a very, I mean, there's a growing momentum, I think, for or growing interest in the sort of 15 minute neighbourhood. Um, the mayor of Paris, I think, has been talking about that, and it's, it's coming out. I mean, I think you touched on it, I think, earlier in your presentation, Ernst, as well. Um, you know, sort of 20 minutes or 15, whatever it is, having been able to walk and plan for that. Um, if I may, um, I have a burning thing I do need to say, though, which I, it's, it's so important. So I just want to get it because it actually then connects to the question that you've asked. I just want to really um, very much second what, what John said at the start around this direction of travel changing on, on devolution is a sort of a worrying drift away from what we where we were and the reason why this is and, and much more of a top-down approach the reason why this is so serious and so important is that to, to, cut, to come back to whether it's walking cycling livable cities whatever we have to we, we have to integrate and plan for, um, in an integrated long term from an integrated long term um, basis. I mean, what, what we've seen at the moment, what we're seeing is a sort of a shift, a much more interest in devolution. I mean, that Andy Burnham was speaking at a net zero event earlier this week, the devolution election. You know, it's, it, there's definitely interest, much more turnout. So we, we have an uh, interest. At the same time, it feels like everything's being sucked back. And you're going to really address these challenges that it, it's local solutions. They need to be under, they, they need to be planned and integrated into the wider strategic economic plan, which London has done so well in over the years. That's very much a model that, that we want to, to, to see and um, replicated out. So in a way, you sort of almost have to start with who's making the decision and, and how does how does this fit with the wider plan? And then whether which mode and and you know and how we plan for different you know more sustainable transport fits within that wider strategic economic plan where you're and as, as i mentioned at the start there's a whole systems approach you're looking at the wider economy what anthony was saying about freight it's all integrated into the plan so there's just a number of points i've been really enjoying the discussion i'm afraid i've probably gone off the question a bit but there's just a few things that i really wanted to pick up on um because i think you've almost got to take a step back and look you know what are we trying to achieve and without the proper tools and resources and governance structures in place and, and all the rest of it and long term secure funding, how can one expect local areas to do all of that? This kind of bits and pieces just doesn't work. So I just, mm -hmm. It's a really sure. important point I just really had to say at the start. 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely, Claire. No, I think that it is important. I'd love to hear from John on, on some of that in a minute mm. in terms of the sort of policy and regulatory and funding mm. um, environment there. Um, could, could I just ask you then, in a nutshell, Claire, yeah. this top question, do you think the focus should be on encouraging public transport use or on making car journeys greener? I mean, from, from what I, I think you're going to say, this, it's got to be a mix depending on the, the yes. outcome. But it, it has to be a mix. Um, it has to be a mix. Um, but look, we aren't going to, however fast we, and we have to get cleaner cars, and it's great that we've got this target, but even with all new petrol and diesel cars, you know, no, no longer ban on those sales by 2030, we are still going to need to reduce traffic on our roads by anywhere between 16, 20 percent, as you know, you know, could be as much as 60 percent. You know, that's the top end estimate. Right. We still have to get people out of cars and, and that will involve public transport, reducing the need for travel, um, more sustainable transport, walking, cycling and so forth. We cannot continue with the sheer volume of traffic on our roads. It's not a popular message. It's not one people want to hear. But we are simply not going to achieve the targets unless we also reduce the volume of traffic on the roads. So that does mean we are going to need to shift more to public transport and other sustainable modes. And that's that's I'm afraid the not always very popular answer, but it's it's yeah. where we are. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Claire. OK, um, John, um, you spoke a bit at the beginning about um, about the need for yeah, greater devolution on funding and sort of policy. Um, looking at Rochdale's specific approach, you know, you're generating disused or underused land around rail stations to deliver new housing or commercial or leisure development. You're, you're, you're sort of in that process at the moment and, and working to identify appropriate plots. Is there anything that you would like then more from central government to be able to do that more effectively? Uh, perhaps are there any planning, you know, use change barriers, et cetera, um, that could be looked at? Yeah, so, well, so there's, I was going to come in slightly on the question that Claire was asked because the uh, cleaner cars or public transport, that's a very transport focused view of the world because, um, like I said earlier, it's about where people choose to live um, and work as well. But what, and I'll come on to that in a minute, but for central government funding, I, I think that the trajectory is, is a detrimental one. Um, other funding pot come through Greater Manchester and there's been, um, to, talk, to talk like an officer, like a place-based approach where they say, well, these are our local priorities and how do we meet these? Um, and what's appropriate use of this funding? And instead, what we're starting to see is local authorities um, starting to develop individual schemes in their local area in the hope that a pot of funding arrives. And when a pot of funding does arrive, they then shoehorn whatever they've produced into that um, funding business case and then cross the fingers. Um, and that's a very inefficient way of looking at how you... Um, it's a very inefficient way of how you look at developing your area and, and your strategies because local areas don't know what's the next pot of funding is going to look like. They don't know what the next series of objectives are. Um, it might suit a central body. You know, we were talking about railways being centralised earlier. Um, and that makes it all completely unresponsive to local needs um, and what local areas are trying to produce. Um, and if you look at um, slides, a lot of development projects are actually um, incredibly localised, it's about shifting that drop curve there or moving that lamp or, uh, you know, putting WLs in here. So having national funding trying to deliver some of these projects is just inappropriate um, and it's not going to lead to um, good results. Just on the point about local barriers to um, developing some of these master plans, it, it does always, I always hear people say, well, the car lobby or people in the cars, you know, how do we balance this? Uh, to drive from A to B and walking and cycling a better public realm provision. As a member, I've been on the council since uh, 2014 and I've uh, been involved in regeneration the entire time I've been on the council. Um, I've never ever received an email from somebody who, or, or a phone call from somebody in a car saying, I couldn't drive through X place um, or I couldn't park at X do get his opposition from businesses, local residents, um, about what they're doing in a very localised way. So a lot of these master plans, when we talk about, hey, well, how do we deliver areas that are not car-centric? It's about bringing the local population on board. 
with these master plans, um, particularly like the ones around the sta Rochdale station. It's less about thinking about Dave who lives, you know, very far away and how is he going to interact with that place. So I don't think when we talk about car use, um, it's more about thinking about well, what do people, how how do people want to travel to an area and the people living and working in that area. Um, are most concerned about that. It's less about these more strategic journeys. Um, yeah, I've, like I said, I've never received a complaint about I couldn't drive here, I couldn't drive through there, I couldn't park. Um, so it's, it's more about getting the, the local message across to people in that area and having the right plan and bringing them on board with it. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, what, what about the, the planning um, point in terms of sort of freeing up land use um, to be able to do more interesting things with um, with uh, stations or, or other kind of transport infrastructure that's that's underused. Yeah, so um, places like Stockport have opted in Great Manchester. We're looking we can have um, mayoral development corporations, but they um, right place horses for Rochdale. The, the council is actually one of the primary landowners, and there's a handful right. of buildings that we want to buy so we can work with them. And then we've now got your SPD in there, <coughs> so we can then CPO those buildings if we need to. Stockport, for example, where they had lots of um, small bits of land use, so lots of different owners in, a, in an area they were trying to develop, then you need something a bit beefier. So you've got your, your mail development corporation that can swoop in and, and assemble land more quickly. A um, bit like they do in China where they just go, this is their hours. Um, maybe, not the, maybe not quite the same. But so, it's, so the, the tools are there. Like I said, I think so often councils think, well, we've got this development, we want to put this transport infrastructure in um, so people can move around. And actually, I think it's better to look at well, what we've got and how do we, you know, transport infrastructure is very expensive and it's about um, adapting your planning policies to um, what and I think the rail corridor strategy in Rochdale is, um, is a good example of that. And there's, a, you know, got a lot of attention because of it. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Um, Ernst, just um, uh, just picking up on, I think you mentioned it in your in your presentation, but looking at sort of more innovative approaches to mobility and getting around. Um, E-scooters, for example, um, what's the scale of opportunity here and, and autonomous vehicles? Um, you know, how, how much can sort of town centres and, and other places accommodate that? Well, I think that, that kind of touches on inclusivity. I've, I'm seeing a lot of teenagers um, with e-scooters and, uh, and you see them in the Manchester City Centre, apparently Bristol, you know, really taking this on. And that's great news for everyone um, to, to make something much more tangible and easy to use to get around without needing to even get on public transport or particularly a car must be a good thing. Uh, really interesting to see how that develops. Um, just touching on on your previous questions as well and what what cities or places you we should learn from i mean the netherlands by is a bias of mine but you know if if they, if they started in 1972 this is a really long play and it needs a coordinated approach which touches on john's point you know ha, is it top down or is it is it actually regionally influenced i'm really um excited about the the idea of the bus network being integrated in gm what a fantastic move that is potentially um so that that's definitely moving in the right direction. But what you see in the Netherlands is a lot of inter, fully integrated, a bit like London, I suppose, perhaps on the next level. You can jump on a tram, a bus, any mode of transport with with a one one with your phone, um, and it's low cost. It's well run. It's efficient, and it's actually thought about not just in one city. It's thought about in the in the Netherlands they call it the Ring City. So it's a population of about the UK north, um, um, but they actually it's one rail network. It's it's all very much joined up, including hiring bikes and e-scooters at the at stations in sort of um, mobility hubs um, uh, at, at local stations. I think that's where we we could be going. In Stratford, you've got a tram station, you do have a train station nearby. But yeah, thinking about those mobility hubs um, strategically, and of course, investing fundamentally in in in, in infrastructure over the long term. That's what's really needed and very exciting, and and it's happening with you know with, with some frustrations that we just vented here. Um, but yeah, and I, finally, I think from an urban design point of view, I, you know, the Netherlands ne never embraced the the mall idea, which encourages longer journeys from a much bigger um, area. 
and and actually there's there's a, you can see this more in the bigger cities uh, central manchester and other cities in the uk but you know do we need to start to encourage local centers to show your shopping convenience there's a lot more smaller shopping uh, supermarkets in the netherlands scattered in a much bigger you know across the board for example and and that encourages short shopping uh, encourages market shopping a sustainable um shopping in terms of you know you you, uh, you can use your products can be fresher it's it's there for you and it encourages the community and i think that's another long play that you know but we we want to be encouraging a series of of nodes across um the uk where we, you can actually hop over to your local center feel part of that connected to that as a community and 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 it's a very easy journey across all age groups uh, old young middle-aged working um and, and others uh, you know and so on um but yeah, I think we're on the, you know, I think GM, TFGM, Andy Burnham, Chris Boardman, we, we're, re I think we're leading the way, aren't we? I think, I think in terms of regions outside of the UK and with people like Anthony Peel and other forward thinking uh, businesses, I think we, you know, we've got a, a number of, of, of great organizations. I, I love what Salford are doing and, and Muse and, and, and yeah, you, we, we, we need to keep going and, and work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Ernst. Um, absolutely. Um, just we've, we've got a couple of minutes um, before we need to wrap up. Um, I'd love to pan out again. Um, Anthony, um, what do you make of the plans for the Liverpool Freeport? Um, you know, how much does the, infra the existing infrastructure need to be adapted and improved to accommodate this sort of heavier, potentially heavier logistics traffic and really kind of aid flows? Good, good question. Um, I, I think we're in a good place already to, to build on that opportunity. At the end of the day, uh, the, the Freeport piece is about trade and it's about inward and outward trade. So in that context, the port you know, has already invested heavily in, in Liverpool too. Uh, the capacity is there um, to handle the uh, boxes in and out. As we've discussed before, we need to get the next step sorted, which is getting those boxes onto the railway lines getting the road network improved to move to the other sites that are part of the Freeport. And in that context, there's conversations about taking that to another level. And that is potentially a network, um, potentially powered by innovative ideas like hydrogen. Uh, you know, maybe we can shunt boxes between the key sites uh, in the Freeport world in that way. But we're, we're waiting for government to announce the next steps on that. So I think that's something to come back to in, in six and 12 months and see how does that Freeport plan shape up and what are the ideas that we can bring around that? Because innovation and decarbonisation are a key thread to that piece of work that is, is so key. I think that leads nicely onto the other question, which is, you know, who else is involved um, beyond that? We've talked a lot about urban centres, but w whether it's freight movements or whether it's people, we've got to remember that um, the whole of the northwest, you know, is full of people who live in small towns, in outer urban areas and in rural areas who don't have the benefit of the network that we've just described, don't have the local train station, don't have the Metrolink, you know, are poorly served by buses. And in that context, you know, the, the car is often seen as the demon, but actually it's the only alternative that they have for their journey. So we've got to be very careful in some of these rules and regulations that we're talking about, how to differentiate between different people in different places so that we don't cause more uh, damage in, in this levelling up question. You know, we, we can cause a lot of uh, trouble by being very singular in our lens as to how we look at this challenge. Some of these problems we're talking about are fundamentally different if you're talking about freight movement versus talking about passengers. And equally in that context, what kind of freight movement or what kind of passenger movement we're talking about. So we need to be very careful as we progress on this, not to be too generic about the ideas, but get into the detail. Yeah, absolutely. And Anthony, actually, I think the two questions we haven't managed from the audience, we haven't managed to sort of uh, you know, pro properly answer, but I think you have touched on them just now, actually, because um, the loss of heavy rail connections into distribution centres such as Traffic Park with its big Amazon warehouse. That's what you're saying, isn't it? That's the next step, actually creating the links between big logistics centres and the wider network. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and that raises the other question of what kind of freight, you know, so talking about Amazon, you know, Amazon is not just a retailer, it, it serves businesses. Um, there's lots of other logistics companies out there that serve very different organisations. You know, Jaguar Land Rover, as an example I mentioned earlier, you know, has logistics challenges which are fundamentally different from the retail logistics challenges. And there are people out there either doing it in-house or doing it with third parties that are solving these in different ways. 
But the, the rail challenge comes back down to, um, as I said earlier, capacity on the railways in the first place, investment in that infrastructure. So Port Salford is an addition. Um, I'd, I'd gladly talk to David after this. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of the loss of heavy rail connections, specifically in Trafford Park. There is the freight terminal there. Yes, there's a challenge around congestion on the railways in Manchester. And in that context, how do we get more freight on the railways when we've got the passengers uh, all trying to use the same network? So we've got to invest more in, in the network, in the signalling to get more trains on the existing the rails that we do have. Um, but it comes down to getting those solutions in place that work to link each of the different sectors, whether it be retail goods coming in from overseas and then being distributed locally, or whether it be the manufacturers that we're trying to attract to, to boost our economy. Yeah, exactly. And then and then the second question sort of, you know, links back to what you were saying about people who are living more sort of disparately and the, the argument for them, you know, yeah, how do you encourage them to ditch their cars when there's just not, a, not any other viable alternatives? So, yeah, I, we've, we've done a sort of whistle stop um, tour through a lot of very big questions. So I hope I hope that's been useful um, to all of our um, delegates and to our panel as well. Um, but yes, that's that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. So thank you so much to our speakers and to our audience as well for your questions. Um, thanks again to our sponsors, Waterman Group and BECG. Um, please do stay around for a further half hour of networking, everyone, to um, continue making contacts and doing business. Our next Place North West event will be the Liverpool Development Update, which is on the 25th of May. You can register for that via our website, placenorthwest.co.uk. So thanks so much again for coming today and we hope to see you all soon.